Welcome to the Styles Council, a podcast all about the England football team. Every couple of weeks, we'll spend half an hour or so dipping into the news, delving into something old or something new, and adding a player to our player wall. I'm Chris Nee, off of the old Styles Council, um, and it's with great pleasure that the old dog has been brought back to life with an old dog of its own. Uh, he's my colleague at IBWM and on the Football Fives podcast. Welcome aboard, Mr. David Hartrick. Thank you. The place is lovely. Like how you've kept it. It's good, since it? it's been mothballed for so long. It looks pretty good, mate. Yeah, I might have to claim the dot com before we go too much further with it. But yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's a it's a name and a concept that I've I, I've liked. We did do a podcast before. We did about ten episodes of it uh, with Lawrence McKenna and Carl Elliott. Um, which was which was I, really good. I fun. remember it well. Yeah. Um, but I think you and I both have the England itch. So it's, it's, Very much it's well so. worth bringing it back. We try and let it bleed into Football Fives as often as we can and, and we get kind of <laughs> shut down a little bit by uh, the non-English and, in fact, the other English uh, quarter of that podcast. So we've we've, <laughs> we've moved it off into its own thing. Um, what we're going to do each week is, is just kind of have a look at a few, or in this case, one salient-ish uh, news item to begin. And uh, not not quite new news, Dave, but but news regardless um, and England related, in a sense, depending on how you view the player himself. Theo <laughs> Walcott signs for Everton uh, from Arsenal. He's kind of relatively significant in England world, isn't it still? If not uh, for, for any other reason, then he has an England youngster competing for his place. Yeah. Uh, uh, people who have sort of followed me on Twitter for a while or listened to the other podcast... I have I've often been accused of having a slight agenda with Theo Walcott, um, and it it's with a it, you know it's with a heavy heart I can say yeah I have, <laughs> <laughs> and that agenda quite simply is I I don't think there's a player in an England shirt who has ever let me down to quite the extent Theo Walcott has, in the. I honestly thought we had a real difference maker and I'm not talking about another Gaza Messiah figure. I'm not talking about another midfielder when we were so amply stocked for so many years in midfield. I thought we had another young kid who would give us something completely different, was absolutely lightning quick. And this is before, I, I should say, this is before the Croatia performance as well. Mm. I was I was really excited by Walcott. And he's just turned to Stodge. He, his, his pace was never... He never capitalised it on it, on it enough for me. He's never kicked on from a certain point. I mean, I don't think there's a player who has plateaued quite as um, quite as obviously as Theo Walcott for so long. And I just feel like he's become the player who only scores when you're two or three nil up. Who he's the, he's that player who's only interested you know, you would never he's not a trench warfare player. He's not a, a player that you would want fighting for you when you're desperate for a result and I just and it it really annoys me it really annoys me because to be perfectly honest with you he should be he took a very understandable move to Arsenal um no problem there but Arsenal have moved him about all over I am surprised it has taken him this long to move there were lots of of rumours about four years ago um, with Liverpool and a couple of other places and I was desperate for him to go from an England point of view. Now he's gone to Everton, I feel like it's too late on in his career and B, it's not the right side anyway because I don't think they're going to utilise or make um, make the best of him or get any more from him if I'm completely honest with you. And it's just... The whole thing's just a bit of a shame for me, really. That's that's how I feel about Theo Walcott's entire career. It's it's just a bit of a shame. What is he? Twenty eight now. Yeah. So it does. The, this move still gives him a chance to kickstart himself. He's got a few years left in the legs, you would think, but he's had a, a an interesting England career, really, because it, it, he he first came into the England picture around the same times as the move to Arsenal in two thousand and six. 
um, and, and you know, fam- famously found himself at the World Cup in Germany um, mm. on the back of no England experience whatsoever. Didn't play when he got there, but he came to fruition for England. I think when we started to get ourselves on the upward swing after the, you know, well, I'll refer to the first. Croatia game and the second Croatia game and people will know what I mean um, the Steve McLaren Croatia game was the was rock bottom within that sort of five six year window and then the second Croatia game Walcott arrives hat trick and the expectation of him didn't seem unreasonably high but it was exciting and it seemed as if he was going to be an excellent player. And then we, we had these years and years of him trying to figure out where he wanted to play and Arsenal not quite lining up with his wishes of, of where he wanted to play. And, you know, he's been there now for 12 years and it's been a strange old Arsenal career. I, I can't speak as a, a supporter, but if I could, I might say he's been both endearing and, and disappointing. <laughs> yeah, I it's... You look at all the attributes he had when he first came onto the scene and he should be absolutely tailor-made to play either side of a front three. I'm going to use the words inverted winger as an inverted winger. He he should be... There's not a player with a more natural gift set, I don't think, to play in that role. And yet, he's not a striker. He's not a true winger. He doesn't really play wide on that front three with any real impact. He can't play deeper. What is Theo Walcott? That's the question I'm sort of left with at this point. Mm. Having thought a long time ago, bloody hell, we we really have got one here, and that's why it's just I, he's just there's I I honestly can't think of another player in my lifetime who has disappointed me to the extent that Theo Walcott has. Who knows? You're right, Chris. There is still plenty of time to... I'm not going to say resurrect career, because let's be honest, he's in a Premier League squad, he's going to get minutes, etc. The bar shouldn't always be at the very top end for every player. But from an England point of view, I I feel like he's, he's a long way from that squad. And I'm not sure. if you If you dropped him into that England squad right now... He doesn't fit anywhere, but I'm. I, I, this is this is my problem with Theo Walcott. Now I'm not sure he fits in any team. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. We we're, we're not certain that Jesse Lingard makes a squad, right? Um, no, which just shows you exactly exactly how far away Walcott is from it, and he's been away from it for a while. Um, he he was injured at the last World Cup. Uh, he didn't go to Euro 2016. He did get back into the squad late in that year. Um, but he was dropped again. And if I remember rightly, Gareth Southgate was really critical um, of, of yeah. the way he played in the two games that he played at the end of 2016. Um, yeah. So it's it's not too bold a shout to ask whether he's finished at England level, is it? Not at all. And I, I think he is. <laughs> I honestly think he is because it's going to take a pretty... At this stage of the season... We're we're coming on towards February now. It's going to take a pretty miraculous about turn form wise to get him near to that squad. In terms of moving from the squad into the team, there's another gigantic gap to cross. I just can't see it. I just can't see it. I would. I, I'd love to be proved wrong. I really, really would. But I've just resigned myself to the fact now that is never going to happen. Mm. And that being the case, as an England supporter, I'm I'm more interested in the knock-on effect of this transfer at Everton with with um, Dominic Calvert Lewin, because um, mm. he's he's been used a lot by Everton this season, and he's they've been happy enough to rely on him as a striker with Wayne Rooney kind of floating around and and that huge supporting cast of unwanted number tens not really doing anything. <laughs> they haven't signed Wal- Walcott to add to that batch of number tens. They've signed him, and he's probably signed for them knowing what he said about his position in the past, to play up front and through the middle. So my initial reaction is to worry about him blocking Calvert-Lewin. Um, is there a positive side to that as well, though? It's uh, to, it's tough to make that case that there is a positive side to it because I think with Calvert-Lewin, you've got a really good... 
young player who has got something about him. I, I don't... He's been used a lot at Everton this season through necessity. But he, every time I see him, I always think he's just 10% sure of being, uh, you know, talked about like a, like a Rashford, you know, or, or someone like that, because he's still really raw. He, and he's clearly a player that is going to benefit from time in the team. So that makes you... That makes you worry with <laughs> with Walcott coming in, does he get it? But I'm not convinced that Walcott's form is going to be that sparkling longer term, that he's not going to get those chances. And he's young, he's got a long way to come, but he seems to have, I mean, he's had had one or two moments in the... Uh, in the derby, obviously, but he seems to have a decent head on his shoulders. So I don't quite know what what to make of it at the minute. I'm I'm slightly undecided, slightly undecided. But I I think he's got enough about him to come through and to to possibly force his way past Walcott, <laughs> and that would be more down to Walcott than Calvert Lewin, to be honest. Yeah, that's one way to spend north of twenty million, Nicker, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, Right, we'll leave that there um, and get stuck into our main topic for the week, which is um, kind of a debating point, Dave. Um, hmm. I, it was the only place I was going to go for the first episode of this podcast. And it's a question. And the question is, was England's 1997 team the best we've had since Italia 90? Um, you know where I'm coming from, Dave. Yes. Yeah. It's... It's a really interesting period for England as well because we had a we had a change of manager in '96 that we knew about. We had a team that went to the semi final of the European Championships in '96, and then we had a very famous team that uh, went out of World Cup '98 in in fairly heartbreaking circumstances. And for me, the team that sits in between those and had Glenn Hoddle as the manager just about edges both of them. Um, and as, as far as this question goes, it ain't my first rodeo. Um, I, the, the golden generation thing um, developed a life of its own in the years after 97. And I always thought back to to what I consider to be better teams in the mid-90s. And after writing a few articles about it, revisiting the 96 team and the 98 team, I came to the opinion eventually that the team that had played in Rome in, in October 97 um, and by extension, the, the 97 team that qualified for, for France 98 was was just uh, better than both of them through sheer weight of ability, um, through having a string of decent results and getting to a World Cup, um, not by the skin of their teeth, but not as easily as, as we qualify sometimes now. <laughs> um, but they are also not weighed down by... Um, by any failure in a tournament as well. So I, I don't particularly see the Argentina game as taking the edge off the 98 team, but it might be playing a little a little part of that as well. And frankly, Glenn Hoddle. Um, and the way it all ended for, for Hoddle um, takes away a little bit from what was, for a long period, a fairly exciting managerial spot for, for England, wasn't it? Yeah, I Glenn Hoddle... Is somebody in terms of being England manager? I think me and you both have quite a lot of affection for him. Yeah, the gaffer. It ended. It, it, it ended absolutely terribly, yeah. and I still look back at how it ended and just think that's like something written in a parody book. It's not that can't have happened in real life, but he had England playing some really good football. But I, I look. I also think back to this team, Chris, and I think about the... I mean, it just makes me sad when I look at some of the places we struggle Mm. in terms of filling a squad right now. The options we had was just crazy. There's, I mean, if you you took the striking berths, you had Ferdinand, uh, you had Shearer, Sheringham... You had Michael Owen coming through and would, as we all know, would be there in 98. Um, and there was more besides. There was the, the names that, that people like, sort of, who are in and 
there or thereabouts with the squad like Robbie Fowler and what have you, who, let's be honest, would be in that squad absolutely nailed on today. Uh, Ian Wright as well. I mean, it, you think back to how many caps Ian Wright got, and that shows you how good that team was, doesn't it? Mm. Let's be honest, because the, you know, he played at the very the, the everybody remembers the the chance he missed that would have sent us all absolutely crazy in that Italy game. Italy went up the other end of the pitch and nearly stole it, which is another story. <laughs> yeah, the header that seemed it to take just, a million years to go wide. Yeah, the, but the 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 wealth of options at striker, the wealth of options in defence was just incredible, and then that midfield, whatever you think of sort of whatever you think of David Batty, for instance, or Paul Ince or what have you, there was certainly no there were no soft touches in that team at all, and Hoddle got them playing in such a way that there was this real mix of silk and steel. And I thought about this question a lot today, Chris, because everybody knows how I feel about that 1990 team. That that Italian 90, rightly or wrongly, is held up in all of our minds as England fans as as a pinnacle, as a high point. That it's been quite fashionable recently to sort of downplay it and say, "Oh yeah, but it was it was a terrible tournament, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. That 1990 side was was incredible when you actually look back through it and. Beardsley, Lineker, Barnes, Waddle, uh, Brian Robson as captain, tell we lost him, obviously. And then you put the sprinkling of stardust in there with Gaza. Incredible. You look at that 97 team, and do you know what, Chris? I think it is better. Be- I think better it than is 90. Better. Mm, I think it is, because in 1990, that squad was the very best we had. That that squad of twenty two we took out there was the best twenty two footballers we had at our disposal. In nineteen ninety seven, I think we were picking from a pool of probably about thirty five to forty yeah. players, who gen- genuinely any twenty two of them in the right positions, obviously, was incredible. And I think you have to sort of look just beyond the the first eleven essentially. And I never thought I'd be saying it. But I th- I think you might be right. I think ninety seven shades it. <laughs> There's... The game that makes me think about this is is the the game that I've I've started referring to as the line <coughs> the lines of Rome. The <laughs> bench that night: two Nevilles, Ian Walker, Steve McManaman, and Paul Scholes, Robbie Fowler. Exactly, <laughs> that is crazy. And exactly, the, the team that played was Seaman, Sol Campbell, uh, Southgate, Adams, Graham Lasso, Gaza. Batty and Ince, which for me, that's it. That's why this team. Beckham, Ian Wright and Teddy Sheringham. <laughs> and think of all the players that aren't in there. I think if you if you get if you take take twenty eighteen, so take the first team from the last England game, who actually gets in there ahead of a player that's already in there? You've got to put Harry Kane in. Yeah, Harry Kane makes it. So ha- Harry Kane probably plays up front for Sheringham. I tell you what, there's not... Uh, off the top of my head, I can't think of anybody else I'd swap, Chris. No. Well, these are top quality players. <laughs> top. Mm. What, where you might look would be, um, do, you, do you find a specialist right back to go in instead of Sol Campbell? Um, that was just on that night. Yeah, but uh, you Never say that, there. but he was he was magnificent on the night. Yeah, if you they remember. all were, he was they, incredible. Yeah. Um, and and the other one, of course, is is the left sided question, as we used to call it, um, which was hmm. um, you know resolutely not resolved on that night. But uh, again, the players in the in the middle of the park did a fantastic job there as well, and and, and Graham was so ably supporting them. Um, I I don't think picking. A 96, 97, 98 team as the best since Italian 90, and actually in, in, in this case now maybe for even longer than that, is that controversial. Where it might be controversial is to pick that team over um, the 98 side. And the 98 side is the one that went to France and did very well in part, had some excellent performances, and had the likes of uh, Beckham, the Nevilles, a few others that year older, that 
extra little bit closer. You know, Rio Ferdinand in, in, in 97 made his debut quite late on in the year. And he was, you know, another six months into his career by France 98. And the other one is is, is reaching a semi-final on, on home soil in 96. And, and I think probably that 96 team, if you separate it out into Venables and Hoddle, the 96 side's the only one that's really got a claim um, of, of competing with 97 or 98 for, for this meaningless accolade that I'm trying to bestow upon them. <laughs> Um, it, it was a lot of the same players, including some that were pretty green. Sol Campbell was was there in '96 and was, you know, for my money, was a far better player as as quickly as '97. Um, Darren Anderton was a difference. He was decent enough in '96, um, but also, and this is this is going to be far too harsh on these players, and it's it's not as bad as it sounds. But Nicky Barnby, Steve Howie, Steve Stone in the '96 squad. Hmm. I think the truth is when you boil it down to an 11, there's not that much to choose between 96, 97, 98. Um, and actually, I think my preference is mainly based on the presence of David Batty. Um, and one of the big differences as well is the managers themselves. Um, I don't think there was a huge difference in quality, but there was a difference in qualities between the two of them. And Hoddle was able to craft and adapt that very good team all the way to that that Argentina game. Um, and for me, the question that remains is, is it is it the, uh, the side that qualified or is it the side that went to the World Cup? And there's a significant one-man difference between those two years. Gaza's omission yeah. is the difference between those two for me. Yeah. That's yeah, what makes 97 I, better. Yeah. Because it was flying I, I, at that point as well. You know, this isn't Gazza on the wane. He was, you know, having a decent second wind of it at, the, at this point. Mm, mm. I I think... I, I can't argue with any of your reasoning. I think that 19... I mean, it's a conversation for another podcast, to be perfectly honest with you. But I think I have this theory about 1996 and how it was the last tournament that teams could get through with uh sort of get through on atmosphere vim and vigor over all else there was a a bit of a sea change after that england got through to the semi-final as we all know as hosts and the atmosphere made a huge difference in say for instance the spain game because let's be honest gascoigne should have been sent off the goal was on side etc etc after that I think football changed globally. And I think 1998, they were far more... They uh, The way Glenn Hoddle had shaped that side since 96, in 97 and going into 98, they were far more tactically savvy. There were far more... There was far more to how they were playing. There was far more in terms of a pattern of play. And I think... The thing about Gascoigne is you are exactly right. We Obviously, we can't go back in time and know how he might have changed France 98. But all I can say is that I don't... I, I think he could have come into that squad and he could have played in any of those games at France 98 and he would have been completely at ease, completely on the same level of talent. He wasn't struggling. He wasn't injured. He wasn't in the twilight of his career, particularly. And he would have been pretty good because that's what Paul Gascoigne did. He went into major tournaments and played his very best football. So I think you're right. That 97 side, because of the Gascoigne inclusion... And a couple of other factors, as I've said, I think I think you're right. I think that's the one. That's the one. Good. I'm glad to. Hear, I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> I've got big plans for that team. Um, we move <laughs> on now to our, our, our player wall feature. Um, we may, and by may I mean will, uh, have a physical version of this and take a photo of it and pop it on an Instagram somewhere. Um, what we're going to do is uh, each fortnight, Dave or I will just bring in a player. Doesn't have to be a good player. 
just a player that we want to talk about has some kind of resonance in the, in the world of the England national team. And we'll chat about him for a few minutes. Uh, I'm, I'll be bringing in Jack Grealish um, at some point soon, Dave. <laughs> You're going to have to start off better than him. And I don't think you've managed it. Uh, who have you got? Uh, I've gone for a Gansu Tianama legend. And that is Paul John Gascoigne. If you're going to start and do this, we may as well start with a biggie. We may as well start with the man who, for me, is the biggest. 57 England caps, which is criminal. <laughs> he should, he should genuinely, he should be touching 100. But the problem was with Gaza. We all know about his problems with alcoholism, etc., etc., and his mental illness issues. He also, that is all a projection of his physical injury issues. He had some absolutely terrible injuries. And he had some real low moments where he got incredibly bad injuries coming back from bad injuries, which must, for a footballer, for I think for any sportsman, must be the most sort of soul-destroying thing. But in an England shirt, I, I am of an age where I can remember Italia 90 extremely well. Mexico 86 was my first World Cup. Italia 90 was my first World Cup understanding that I was an England fan and that I wanted England to do well. And the darkness around the back end of that decade, even as as a really young football fan, you were almost uh, discouraged from being a football fan, even at a young age. It was, uh, there, there was violence on the terraces and it was front page news every single day and you had Maggie wanting to come up with all sorts of silly ID schemes. And then Italia 90 happens and there's this lightning rod playing for England who not only is playing without any sense of fear, but who is also galvanising everybody else around him. And there was, there's a great quote from um, Italia 90, and I, I think it was Chris Waddle who was who was talking about Gascoigne on a... I think it was something to do with Radio 5 ages and ages ago. Sorry I can't cite it better than that, but it was a long time ago, where he said that in that Italia 90 squad, there was two groups of people. There was Gazza's mates, and there was those who were pretending to be Gazza's mates because they knew that was the only way to get the best out of that team. Because he just everything revolved around him and he then kicks on for England in terms of he and this is slightly controversial but I think in 1996 at Euro 96 I actually think he was better than he was at Italia 90. At Italia 90 bursts onto the scene but he's still incredibly raw and he's incredibly naive at times in 1996, when you go back and watch games, it is incredible the level of maturity he actually plays at and the way he, his game management through games and the way he, particularly, I mean, if you, if you want to see a bit of a masterclass of somebody who knows when to turn it on but also knows when to rein it in, when to get everybody else back in order, watch the 4-0 against Holland again. And you'll see uh, uh, there's a real level of Gaza coaching other players through it. Now, when you think of all the all the things we can say about Paul Gascoigne in 2018, it's incredible to talk about him in terms of standing out for his maturity, let's be honest. But he was incredible at Euro 96. And England were incredible at Euro 96. They wouldn't have been without Gaza. They, they just wouldn't. And... It's fitting to start with with Paul Gascoigne because some of my England heroes are players who've only played five or ten games. Others are, you know, very obvious names. But Gazza is the one for me that a pretty much made me go from uh, a young fan who really liked football to somebody who was in love with it and basically then developed this horrific lifelong addiction which has, has both lifted me up to places I never thought I'd ever be able to go and kicked me in the balls so many times it's untrue. But also he's the player that, for me, when I think about an England shirt, it's Gaza I see in it. 
every single time. So it may be boring, it may be cliche, it may be obvious, but there is genuinely only one place to start for me, mm. and that's with Paul John Gascoigne. Ten years and ten goals for England. Uh, yeah. De- they were decent goals as well, Dave. Absolutely brilliant. There's... there's um. <laughs> If you if you go on uh, one ball for Gaza, which is my little England Twitter account that me and Adam Hurry have set up, I've put together all his England goals into one moment, um, and there are several. There, there's the early goals which are all bustling runs, arms up in the air, roofing the ball. There's a couple of just so clever. The finishes mm. are just so so clever. Is it, is it against there's, Moldova the one we puts the keeper on his ass? Yes, and just rolls yeah. in the other uh, side. Just, yeah, just completely dummies him and leaves him on his ass. And there's there's a really good header away against stuff. The top of my head, I think it might be Turkey. I think we beat them. Is it Turkey? It might no, might be somebody else. But we beat them two 0 And Gaza gets the first with a header from like just inside the mm. box, nearly at the edge of the box. It's just a magnificent header. Yeah. His, his other header was like a mini luck. one of those as well. Yeah. So. Uh, but I think the the other thing it's worth saying with Gascoigne is that when when he was good, he he honestly he made everybody else around him good. He lifted that team. He galvanised that team. People thought, well, we're all right because Gaz is on form tonight. And that's when you read back, you know, England players' autobiographies, as we've both been prone to do, etc. <laughs> yeah. They all say the same thing. Within five minutes, if he was on it and if he was up for it, they were fine. They relaxed. They played their football themselves. So it's it's extremely sad what has happened to him, but that shouldn't ever take away from a, just a magnificently talented footballer. Mm. And it's relevant to tonight's discussion as well, and we'll just leave it with a, a recommendation you don't get a lot when it comes to Gaza. Uh, if you can go away and watch some of his Rangers highlights, oh, it, yeah. it's so worth doing. Um, yeah. I, I, for whatever reason, I saw quite a lot of him uh, playing for Rangers at that point in time, and that's the Gaza I remember as a slightly younger England fan, the mid-90s Gaza. Um, and that ability to kind of glide past players... Uh, apply a bit of strength where it was needed the shimmy that he he always had um and that that barrel in style um because he was he was very very graceful but he also looked just just that little shade awkward when he was running with the ball but what glued it all together was the fact that the ball was always under perfect control mm. um so Worth having a look, and it's worth having a look at his England goals as well, because actually I think although there were only 10 of them, um, they absolutely demonstrate his best moments in an England shirt because so much of it is interplay with uh, with colleagues around the edge of the box. So many of them have got him running past players and running on the ball, and so many of them show that, that ability to just take that, that extra touch, be that extra thought ahead of the defence, and to have composure yeah. in front of goal. Yeah, that that's exactly it. And I, in terms of just sort of the ratio between goals and quality of goals, there's only Joe Cole, who is another player I'll talk about on another pod, who comes close to him in terms of just nearly every goal being a really good goal. So, yeah, only one place to start. Sorry, folks, but you, he, he is out the way, so we could all <laughs> move on now. We'll never mention him again. <laughs> That's a lie. Um, and, and with that, we've reached the end of our first episode. Uh, I, I'm at Chris M. Nee on Twitter. He's at David Hartrick. Um, and you can follow uh, Sphinx FTBL on Twitter and Facebook for some other podcast bits and even more exciting football stuff to come. Cheerio. Cheerio. Cheerio.